Welcome to the final talk of the day. Algebra, you already know it. And I know, I know, this was maybe not what you thought you wanted to listen to for the last 20 minutes separating you from dinner. <laughs> That's okay, bear with me. My name is Aurora Hoffman. I work as a backend developer at NAV, but I also have a master's in physics and math. And for the time that I've been working, my experience is that a lot of developers get a little bit anxious when it comes to math. So my goal for the next 20 minutes is that when you leave here, you get a little bit less scared if you see or encounter a mathematical expression. I also want to show you that you actually use a lot of these concepts in your daily life as a programmer. So actually, it's not even new. you. You already know this kind of stuff. I am going to end with showing you something that you may not know. And I do this because I think that every time our brain hurts a little bit, it makes our possibility to learn something new a bit larger. And that is really relevant in our job. OK, so today we are going to talk about sets represented by this drum set. We are going to talk about functions represented by this function wave. And we are going to end with groups. That's algebra. <laughs> but let's start with sets. This is probably something that you all have a natural feeling of what it is. Um, this is some Kotlin code where we see a set of fruits. And we can see that even though I put apple in my set twice, when I print my set, apple will only appear once. And that is because a set only consists of each value one time. So duplicates are ignored. Now, how would I represent this mathematically? Usually, when we represent sets in math, we use big capital letters. So for example, my set of fruits can be represented by a capital letter X. And if I have my set X, I can ask questions like, is an apple represented by a lowercase letter X, often with an index, an element, that's the E, of my big capital letter X, which represent my entire set of fruits. I can also ask, is an avocado represented by x2, an element of x? And here I say, no, this is not an element. That's the e with the line through it. So this is just how I would abstract what fruit and apples and all these words are. And I can write it really, really compact. I can also decide to make a different set. For example, all fruits with leafy things on the stem. I represent this by a capital letter Y. And maybe I want to know if Y is a subset of X. So are the fruits with leafy things on the stem a part of the larger set of fruits? Now, don't panic, OK? <laughs> Everyone take a breath so that we lower our stress levels. <laughs> this. <laughs> is uh, the mathematical definition of a subset. We're going to take it really, really slow. So we start to your left, and we say, why, so my fruits with leafy things on the stem, is a subset of x, all fruits, if and only if, that's the arrow going both ways, for every lowercase y, so for every fruit with a leafy thing on the stem, if that fruit is an element of all the fruits with leafy things on the stem, then that leafy fruit also has to be an element of all the fruits. If this holds, then you have a subset. <laughs> all right? That sets. <laughs> Let's move on to functions. Again, this is a coding example. I start out with my set of fruits. 
and then I want to do stuff to it. So for example, here I apply a filter where I filter on the letter length longer than more than five. I can do a map, I can do a sort, I can do a join to string, and all of these actions are actually functions. All right? Let's focus on the filtering part. So what happens in my filter? I go from my set of all the fruits, I apply my function, and I end up with the set of only fruits with letter lengths longer than five. All right? So I go from a set, my starting point, to a set, my endpoint. Now these have names. They are called my domain. That's where I start. That's where the input data lives. To my codomain. That's where the output data lives. Okay? And these spaces can sometimes be the same space. Also, my function can have properties. They can be, for example, injective, one to one. They can be surjective, onto, or they can be both, and then we call them bijective. I'm going to walk you through the examples. Let's start with injective, or one to one. Now we remember that we have our input space, our domain, and we go to our output space, the codomain. And in this example, both of these spaces is the set of integers, or natural numbers, and my function is 2 times x, okay? So my function is injective, or 1 to 1, if there is only one value in my domain that maps to the same value in my codomain. So in this case, that means that only 3, for example, in my domain will map to 6 in my codomain. You don't have any other integer that would map to 6 if I times it with 2. However, as we see here, nothing will map to uneven numbers, because you can't do that when the function is 2 times x. So we can go one way, but some values don't really have something. And that brings us over to a surjective function, or onto. Now, if we change our spaces, so now our domain is the set of real numbers, and our codomain is the set of positive real numbers. And my function is x squared. Now in this case, we know that for every positive number, we can actually take the root, and we can come back to our original space. All right? But there are actually several values in our domain that map to the same point. All right? You still with me? Great. If I want the possibility to move in circles, I need both of these properties. So another example, we go from the integer space to the integer space with the function x plus 2. Now I can start anywhere. I can, for example, start with 3. I can add 2, end up in 5. And I know that I can subtract 2 and get back. But I can also start in my codomain with 5. And I can subtract 2, end up with 3. And I can add 2 again and end up in the same space. So this is really cool. OK, so this was sets and functions. This was our warm-up. <laughs> now let's move on to the firework, the last part, namely groups. And before I start now, a little note. Sets and functions is probably something that you use, like in some form or another. I'm going to talk to you now about group theory and what a group is. And it's probably not something that you're really going to use. Why am I talking to you about this? Kind of because I think it's fun. <laughs> but also because I hope that this gives you a teeny tiny fundament to build on if you ever encounter a really complex problem. Because that's the cool thing about math. It has actually already solved a lot of our complex problems. 
and we can meet them when we actually program. For example, with optimization, or if we do geometrical stuff with 3D gaming things, we might need math. OK, so what is a group? A group consists of a set and an operation. An operation is basically just a function. So we need a space where we do things, and we need to know what we want to do. And this set and this operation together has to fulfill four rules. Now, these rules are called closure, associativity, identity element, and an inverse. I will go through them step by step. We start with closure. OK, so if we have the set or the space of natural numbers, integers, closure means that if you do something to that set, now I choose my operation to be addition, so I take two elements and I add them together, I have to know that I am still inside my original space. So I can take 1 plus 1 or 10 plus 5, and I know that what I end up with is still a number, right? What would not be closure? Well, if I take natural numbers and division, then I could take 1, divide by 2, and I would end up with a half. But 1 half is not an integer, so then the system breaks. Right? OK. Associativity, the second rule. Associativity basically means that you can put brackets wherever you want. So if I can take 1 plus 2 and then add 3, and that's the same as taking 1 plus 2 plus 3, then I have associativity. And you know that you have it if you can write an expression without brackets. Then you're good. OK, third rule, the identity element. The identity element means an element that doesn't change anything. It doesn't do anything. So with natural numbers and addition, this is 0. You can add 0 to any number, and it doesn't change anything at all. Cool, right? <laughs> Final rule is the inverse. And now we come back to what we talked about with functions, right? Because the inverse means that for every element, you must have a different element that gives you the possibility to come back. So here, I have 5, and then I add 1, and then I add minus 1, and I get back to where I started. So what we've seen here is that natural number with the operation of adding two numbers is a group. Maybe you're wondering what's not actually a group. Well, let's look at strings with the operation of adding. Now, can we add two strings together and end up with a string? Yeah, we can. We can glue them together and it's still a string, right? Now, if we look at this code line 20 to 22, we're checking for the second condition, associativity. Can we put brackets wherever we want? And we can see from the output code that we get, hello, you are cool, at every step of the way. So we can put brackets wherever we want, and it doesn't change anything. So that's good, too. Now we check for this third condition. Do we have an identity element? And with strings, actually, we do. We can use the empty string. We can add an empty string, and nothing really happens. So this is what you see again. We have, hello, you are cool. <laughs> but you can also see that I've commented out a line. Because what's up with the inverse? How do we kind of get back, remove a word, or something like that? If I try to run this code uncommented, it looks like this. <laughs> because we don't really have a sense of minus cool or inverse coolness. It doesn't really exist. So here we see that strings with addition of two strings is not a group. So that's a bit sad, but <laughs> usually it's OK. 
So what have we learned? We've learned about sets, and we learned that they can be represented with letters, if we want to. We've learned a little bit about functions, and domains, and codomains, and that something can bring it from one place to another. And we've learned a little bit about groups. Now what I want you to take away from today is that it doesn't have to be scary. Most of the time it can actually be explained, even though it's kind of really complicated algebra. So if you encounter a problem that is really, really, really hard, don't be intimidated to look up if there's actually a solution to your problem. Because there could be, and I promise you, you can also understand it if you just take the time and have someone explain it to you in a calmly manner. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>